On the last few videos, we've been talking about the shoreline formation and how erosion and deposition work together both to destroy and construct new rock near the continents and also to create the beaches. Now, in this video, we're going to talk about living shorelines or life actually interacting with the shoreline to create it or destroy it. Now, when the first thing I think of when I think of living shorelines, I think of the intertidal zone. Now, the intertidal zone is the area that's sometimes above tide, sometimes below tide. So we're talking about things that happen at the shore face. So it's the life that's right there at the beach. And this can also, of course, happen in areas which are not beach areas. It could be marine erosion uh, um, areas. It could be all kinds of different areas of the ocean. And so marine shorelines can sometimes have life living in it. And these are different areas of the intertidal zone. Some zones are called the splash zone, which are areas which are actually considered part of the dry beach. So they're never ever under underwater, so they're above the high tide area. But still, some waves start, still splash over that. And so you can get some growth of moss, of some of crabs and shrimp, things like that can actually live in these areas. Then where it's sometimes above, sometimes below tide, you get molluscs, shell-like animals, all of these things. And then you also have below the low tidal area, it's also considered part of the intertidal zone, you have things like algae and seagrass and sea urchins and sea stars and sea sand dollars and crabs and lobsters and and small fish and all kinds of different life forms which are considered benthos and or small nekton animals which will live really close to the shoreline. This is an area that sees a lot of change in biotic or abiotic factors because sometimes it's above water, sometimes it's below water. There's a very peculiar and diverse part of the ocean which sees a lot of these features that we talked about. Now, these animals living in the water will actually help or deter erosion. If you think about seagrass, present in the rock might actually reduce the erosion that the rock is undergoing. Meanwhile, dry, bottom dwellers and even the friction of growing things in the rock might actually accelerate the erosion process of the rock. You have both sides of the coin in life. So life definitely has plays a factor in actually creating the features of the shoreline, including the actual geological features of the shoreline. Now, another thing that about living shorelines is the idea of reefs. Now, reefs in general is any time that you have a sudden decrease in the shallowness of the water because of some sort of rocky-like structure. So, for example, let's say that you have the bottom of the ocean looks something like that. You have the shoreline and then you have a platform and then you have a drop off so maybe this platform is the is the air that was cut by the waves we talked about in the last uh, video the wave cut platforms and things like that and then you have the water level somewhere somewhat above that and remember this water is constantly working in the cliff and trying to erode more and more of it as we go along and eventually creates a beach and all that but this wave cut platform is going to be where it starts and then maybe Many, many years later, you might get uh, a little bit of sand accumulated here and you actually get that little uh, steady slope that is constant from the continental shelf and things like that. Or you might get a berm over here because the water, the waves are accumulating and things like that. But a reef would be something that suddenly increases the, the, the shallowness, decreases the shallowness of the water. So maybe a piece of rock that did not erode as fast as other rock did. So maybe, for example, you have the remnants of a sea stump or a sea stack that was left behind after the cliff uh, got eroded. And now it looks like the water level is actually down here, but the boat might miss this big lump of rock that's sitting over there, which is why we usually have lighthouses near these things because you, want, you don't want the boats to actually hit areas which are full of reefs. So if the boat is coming through here, it's going to have to avoid a rock that's, that's, that's that large because it's going to suddenly decrease the shallowness of the water. So instead of the water being uh, this deep, it will only be about this deep. And that's what a reef basically is. Now this can be rock or the familiar coral reefs. Now remember, coral reefs are living reefs, reefs generated by life. And basically the coral, which is an animal, uh, which Landarian, it's a type of animal that lives in the ocean that accumulates over thousands and thousands of years, There's all different kinds of coral, and you see examples of them here, uh, they will be living in this area and accumulating. Now, coral is a carbonate-rich life form. It actually 
lives in carbonate rich waters so we're talking about the same kinds of waters that support things like foraminians they have to be nutrient poor shallow waters in order to be able to grow this coral so the same kinds of waters that make shell like animals survive makes coral survive the ex the skeleton Feet or the hardness of the coral is given because of the calcium carbonate. This is what actually becomes limestone after the coral dies off. So thousands of years of accumulation of coral pressed under pressure of the ocean actually went on to become limestone. And so coral is an organism that lives in symbiosis with algae. So it actually needs sunlight. So it needs to be in shallow water. So coral does not make its or eat its own energy. It basically filters the water for the nutrients. And by living in symbiosis with the algae, it gets the nutrients straight off the algae that lives inside of it. And meanwhile, the algae gets protection and nutrients off the coral. And it gives back to the coral the sugar that it produces with the sunlight. And so they live in a symbiotic relationship. And then other types of coral actually have to filter the uh, water. They don't actually have algae living in them. But the majority of coral actually has algae living inside of them, uh, which is actually having a symbiotic relationship. Either way, coral makes its hard shell based of carbonate it's calcium carbonate ions. And so as the coral dies off and new coral grows on top of that, that old coral goes on to become limestone. And that's how states like Florida are built. Basically a large platform coral that accumulated over thousands and thousands of years to become a reef that then accumulated sand to become an actual uh, part of an island or a, ter a terrain that, that was added to the continent successively. But Cor Florida, especially South Florida, is essentially one large reef or a large dead reef, which is actually still around. Surrounding the entire South Florida, you have a, we have barrier reefs, which we're going to talk about next. Mm -hmm. All right? Now, the basic structure of a reef is that when the reef is close to the shore, so the reef is really close to the shore face, we're talking about the inner shelf, all right? So that's in the, in the, that is going to be constantly blasted by wave motion, which is going to erode the top of the coral off. So the inner reefs are usually flat on the top because the waves are cutting them off. Then as the water gets deeper and below the, the maximum depth of the waves, in other words, below 1.5 times the wavelength of the highest waves that ever come around this area, you're going to have coral now growing larger and, and, and higher because you are, don't, or they're no longer being eroded by waves. And then as the continent gets too deep, the, the coral basically levels off and it can't go deeper than that because remember it lives in symbiosis with algae so if the water is getting too deep the coral can't really live because the water the, the, it's not getting enough nutrients from the algae because the algae is not getting enough sunlight so the fore reef is usually lower than the reef crest but as it gets too low it basically ends up so that's going to run from the inner shelf all the way to the outer shelf but as the water gets too deep, the coral is not going to be able to get deeper than that because it needs the sunlight to support the algae that lives in symbiotic relationships with the coral. Now, underneath all that coral, you have thousands of years of accumulated uh, limestone, which is made basically of the carb calcium carbonate shells of these corals. So the, the carbon is being deposited into rock by the pressure of the ocean and by the pressure of coral growing on top of old dead coral. And by the way, it takes thousands of years to grow a large coral all right just to put in perspective coral will grow very very slowly even under the perfect conditions it will grow a, a meter in things something like 10 20 years and so to grow a, a coral reef that's kilometers around you're talking thousands of years of growth and when humans uh, cause global warming things which change the chemistry of the water and flood the water with nutrients remember this needs to be a nutrient poor water because the carbonate calcium carbonate chemistry which is necessary to make the shells of the coral are only going to happen in nutrient poor waters if the water is too nutrient rich it's going to have other stuff in there chemicals which are going to interfere with the coral formation process and so as we cause global warming we change the, the delicate temperature balance as we cause global warming which adds more carbon dioxide increases the, uh, 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 the acidity of the washing water and we add too many nutrients because of sewage and things like that we end up destroying the big coral reefs of the world. Now, there are several types of coral reef. One of the most common types is the barrier reef. You see pictures here of the Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Australia. Barrier reefs are basically similar to, to barrier islands, which are caused by longshore currents. And there's basically a large, long, continuous line of coral that forms around the outside of, of continents and act like a shield that protects the continents from actual wave motion. 
So the waves splash against the reef, but not against the, the continents too much. So the waves never quite hit the continent with a lot of power because the, the coral reef actually interferes with the wave motion and slows them down. Examples are the Florida Great Reef and also the Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Australia. By the way, you see these little patches of coral? They're also called patch coral. So in the Great Barrier Reef, you actually have both the barrier reefs. You just see that one continuous line here. That's an example of a barrier reef. But you also have the patch reefs, and you can see them here. And by the way, if this patch reef keeps growing, it will eventually connect to each other and form one large coral island. And that's pretty much what made Florida. All right? Another type of famous reef is called fringe reef. You see several pictures of fringe, fringe reefs here. Fringe reefs are basically uh, reefs that form around the rim of, of an island. Islands typically have are made of sea mounts, right? So they fall very quickly to the bottom of the ocean. So the coral can only grow very close to the island, not the way they will go in a continent where it has a continental shelf. Since islands don't have that extended shelf, basically the coral grows really close to the island. You can see that here. And so fringe coral is different from barrier islands made of coral because barrier islands grow in the continental shelf, while fringe coral grows right off the shore of islands. And just like the barrier reef, they slow down the waves which hit these islands. And you can see very good examples in the pictures down here. Another example of coral, it's called it's atolls. Now, atolls grow around islands as well, but islands that have not breached the surface. So we're talking about volcanic islands, and you'll see a picture of how that looks like here. Basically, the reef will grow around the island, creating the, what it looks like a rim for this island. So the island is actually below the sea level. It's not actually, it's like a very large seamount. It has not actually breached the surface yet. This can, by the way, also happen around the edge of a guillot. If this grows large enough, it can actually form an island, an island made of coral. And that's what the Bikini Islands and a lot of islands, Bora Bora, and a lot of islands in the Pacific are like. So you can see that. Another type of coral is what we call the platform or patch coral. And that's when large pieces of coral grow separate from each other. You can see how it looks like here. And basically, this reef will go into a platform, and as a platform connects to other platforms, you'll make one large platform reef, which is what the way the Florida, for example, was made. Now, I'll remember that all this coral is very delicate. It needs specific temperatures, specific pH, and specific levels of nutrients in order to survive. If you have too much nutrient, too low of a pH, or too hot temperatures, coral will not grow, and it can't grow too deep either. So as the sea level water rises, the coral will eventually die. So melting will cause a lot of problems for coral. Here's more examples of patch coral. By the way, when patch coral becomes large enough, we actually call it platform coral. So you see examples of that here. Now, another type of living shorelines is what we call estuaries. Now, estuaries are areas of water which are actually fresh water and salt water at the same time. So it's usually an enclosed area that has rivers feeding into it and at the same time you have ocean water coming through to it usually through an inlet you remember we're talking about inlets a small little uh, opening and then this ocean water when the tides come in it will bring salt water to mix in with the river water and create a brackish water environment and so you can see here how you have for example an inlet right there which allows the, the salt water to mix in with the fresh water coming from this river so you have fresh water coming from this river and then salt water coming from the ocean here which makes a brackish water estuary in between and there's two major kinds of estuaries okay you have the ones you see here which are actually called salt marshes which are basically mostly like grassland like and they're basically large grass plains which have plants resistant to salt water and they're typical on temperate zones when it doesn't get too hot and it does not a lot of sunlight and nutrients in order for, for this to grow into larger pl types of plants and you will get a lot of animals that live in these areas as well living off the the plants which are resistant to the brackish water and the animals just like the plants have to be adapted to live in both the fresh and the salt water and then you have mangrove swamps which are very common in tropical areas like Florida for example and then the mangrove swamps will basically be made of larger trees with big big roots and all, lots of fish and other kinds of animals all adapted to be underwater flooded sometimes during the high tide and when the low tide comes out, comes back you get less water and then more fresh water than brackish water so mangrove swamps are becoming in tropical zones and salt marshes are going to be common in the temperate zones but together the intertidal zone 
the coral reefs, which are the barrier, the fringe, the atolls, and the platform or patch reefs. And then you also have the estuaries, which are mangrove swamps and salt marshes, constitute areas of the shoreline, which are our living shorelines. And you definitely need to know about that before you proceed to the next topic, where we're going to talk about the topics, types of shoreline to close up or shoreline chapter. See you guys then.